Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown, an episode where I have absolutely no idea what's going on, because Kevin wrote this episode and he sent me an email, and... Oh, hi, welcome. Um, this is a show where we decode the unknown. Is that really necessary? It's a podcast, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, anyway, Kevin sent me this email, and he says, Hey Simon, this script's a bit different than all. You need your tablet to record it. Got that in front of me, and so the usually printed script. There's a script and there are also two videos, one to watch before reading the script and one to watch after, both while filming, of course. So here we are. I can't tell you the topic of the script, and I know this whole thing seems a bit out there right now, but I'm 99.9% confident that you're absolutely going to love this one. Thanks. And have fun. I like that this is my job. (laughs) Like, this feels like I'm part of a game. And uh, this is what I this is what I do for money. Uh, okay, so I tried. I thought these would be links, but they're some sort of weird internet videos that Kevin has downloaded and attached to an email. So Jen, who edits these videos, hi Jen. Hello Simon. I'm going to I guess send these to you. And uh, I've I've absolutely I haven't cheated. I've got no idea what's about to happen, but I'm going to watch it myself. Okay, unsupported file type. I'm going to get my laptop. I hope this is one of those ones where Kevin's like, ah, the joke is that you've now got a virus, Simon. Ha 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 ha. We're like, Kevin, you d. Oh, come on. Come on. Really? No battery? I'm having all sorts of technical troubles, hopefully not caused by this. Ah, uh, great. I've got to download the video because it doesn't work. And. Come on, VLC player. You are like the ultimate player. It's a 9 megabyte video file. This is going to be very low quality or very short. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Hello, Simon. Would you like to play a game? You know, we're not that different, you and I. Like you, I was once also a podcast host with a running joke that half the people locked up in my basement. In my case, it was Girl Scouts, chained up and forced to make me cookies. But I saw the error of my ways. I let the girls in their delicious thin ones go, and I dropped 90 pounds. Now, it is your turn. As you can see, I am coming to you live from the basement where you imprison your writers and editors. In your hands is a script containing five internet mysteries. Or is it? Perhaps it is five fantastical tales conjured from my imagination to trick you. It is your task to determine whether each mystery presented is true or fiction. And to make things interesting, for everyone you guess incorrectly, I will let one of your staff go, starting with Danny. To make sure you don't cheat by peeking ahead, the answers are nowhere in the script. I'll be back at the end of the episode to tell you how you did. Good luck, Simon. And let the games begin. What the fuck just happened? Holy shit! Above and beyond, Kevin. That is legit. I I genuinely did not expect this to be a custom-made video. And this isn't just Kevin looking at the screen. He's wearing like a costume and shit. If this is Kevin, I'm assuming it's Kevin. He's wearing like a hood for people listening at home. He's wearing like a hood. The voice changer, maybe a little over the top. I didn't make out some words, but I definitely got the gist of it. I have been presented with five internet mysteries and I have to determine whether they are true or false. And at the end, Kevin will tell me in another video. I'm excited. Let's play some games. Okay, here we go. It even says on the front here, super secret decoding the unknown script. Do not turn this page until you have begun filming and watched the first video yeah because the first thing i did when i got the script from kevin was open it up and then i saw this and i was like okay there's more to this i should read kevin's email all right internet mysteries fact or fiction and play along at home and see how you do lemantita Lamantita was the name of a Reddit user from Argentina. I'm not sure why he chose the name, which translates in English to The Blanket, but I chose to believe it was because he was a huge Michael Jackson fan. I don't get it. Wait, what's Michael Jackson got to do with blankets? In 2004, Lamantita posted about wanting to enter Villa 31, a notorious Argentinian slum, to interview people and take a tour of soup kitchens and such. He was known to work uh, some sort of production company in an extremely limited capacity, so perhaps he thought this project could be his big break. Redditors from the area had warned him vehemently not to enter the slum without a local guide, and 
that even then <clears throat> it was a terrible idea. The Argentinian slums are extremely dangerous places for outsiders. They're rife with the sorts of illegal activities that you would expect in a slum in any nation. But there are they are also set up like mazes to make escape impossible for anyone who's not familiar with the area. These areas are so dangerous, the police don't even bother to enter them. Dude, that's like that prison in prison break where they're like, it's just run by the inmates. They have gangs. And I'm like, that sounds like a horrible. I'd rather be in a prison where it's run by guards because it's probably safer. Where they just, the guards are just outside and they're like, yo, anyone comes out, we shoot them, we sometimes send some food in. That doesn't sound fun. Lamentita posted that he had found a guide who was going to take him on a tour of the area, but this was the last post he ever made. The first thought was that this was just a hoax from a throwaway account, but the account was over six months old with posts on a variety of subjects. He posted everything from where can I watch the Mayweather fight on Saturday to you usa osama's not dead <laughs> okay <laughs> all right then uh this is argentina so perhaps he thought he saw osama palling around with hitler and all of his nazi buddies or maybe lamentito was just an unstable individual either way if it, this was a fake account it would have been it would have shown an immense amount of dedication and it is believed that this user was genuine so if we assume that he was real what happened Ah, uh, I'm assuming so far that this story is real because it has these kind of like not too many details like it's not overly detailed it reads like fact although to be fair this is the first time Kevin's done this and I've only done I think three scripts from Kevin before so I'm not super familiar with his writing style we play a similar game on one of my other channels uh with uh, the writer Danny there and uh, oh by the way in the in the beginning kevin was saying like he'll free people from my basement it's an ongoing joke that the writer from that channel is trapped in my basement churning out scripts and uh i mean maybe uh and kevin was saying that he will free them if i get them wrong ah i'm gonna get these all right i'm definitely not because if this is fake it's very convincing so far the most obvious answer was that against the advice of literally everyone lamentita went to villa 31 and was murdered there was no report of the crime but there may not have been a body to find either locals love to joke on reddit that he was chopped up and fed to dogs hilarious guys but whether this was the case or not with the police unwilling to enter villa 31 there's no way to know for sure what happened to him is he dead was he conscripted into slavery did he chicken out and abandon reddit so as not to have uh, to publicly reveal his shame or maybe the cia got him for trying to reveal the truth about bin laden <laughs> Yeah, maybe not. It's been over seven years since Lamentia's disappearance, so we're unlikely to ever get an answer. I don't like to assume the worst, though in this case it seems the most plausible explanation of what happened. But what do you think, Simon? Where do you think Lamentia is now, or do you think he ever existed at all? You made a lot of videos across your channel, so I did pick a mystery from Argentinian Reddit because I was confident you would not have tr uh, known about it to try and trick you into thinking it was fake. Or would you that be too obvious? So instead, I wrote a fictional story and chose a remote setting to make you think it was real oh my god i think it's real i think this is real and i probably think the dude got murdered this is i don't know it feels like dark i think it's real the story is real like this happened on reddit whether the guy actually went there i don't know but i'm saying this is a real internet story number one real cast your vote at home now it's carrier.com this is another story that dates back to the days of Usenet newsgroups. One day, an anonymous user on alt.pl.internet posted about the existence of a strange website, iscarrier.com. The landing page of the website didn't seem unusual, it was just an empty page requesting login information. Alright, fine, so it was a private site that didn't want anyone in it. Most people would assume that they weren't invited and just leave, but the Usenet poster had decided to dig a little deeper. By examining the source codes of the website, they were able to determine that behind this login page was an amount of data that would have been unfathomable for the late 90s. We're talking files upwards of 40 gigabytes each and a server containing a total of multiple terabytes of data. That is ridiculous in the 1990s. I was watching, I've been watching, uh, re-watching Star Trek Voyager. It's like a late 90s, early 2000s. That's, if I had to guess, 95 to 2002 or 94 to 2001, something around that. And there's one episode where the guy's like, on my servers, there's 3,000 gigabytes of information. And I, I just like, n people watching in the 90s would be like, what is that giant server farm? You got so much information. And uh, now I'm like, yeah, okay, that's like not that much. It's like a few, it's a, a few months of recorded videos or weeks. As an I make like 70, 80 gigabytes of stuff a day, roughly, on average, I think. But it's a hell of a lot of data for the 90s. 
This represented not only a massive amount of data being hidden, but an exorbitant cost to host such a website. Not just a financial cost either. The amount of time required to upload the data at 1990 speeds, even if they had a dedicated T1 line, was absolutely staggering. People were immediately intrigued, and of course the first step was to break in. Well, they didn't necessarily have to upload the data, did they? Because these servers behind there could be where the data originated. Like if it's the NSA gathering data, because I feel like this is some NSA shit. If this is but then I don't feel they'd have a public logon page. Although I guess people would have to remote access into this data somehow. Anyway, if this was the NSA gathering all this data, right, then it would just be collected at their server farm and then stored there behind the thing. It wouldn't be uploaded to another server somewhere. So I'm saying that's this so far, fine. But that's where things got stranger. No one could break into this website. The methods of hacking in the 1990s weren't as sophisticated as they are now, but the scrutiny was even less sophisticated. Somehow, Iscariot was resistant to these attacks. They even tried a coordinated attempt to brute force their way through the login screen. It's a similar principle to how a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack works in present day. Even if they didn't get inside, they should have at least taken the site offline for a period of time. Normal websites back then were not meant to withstand multiple users attempting millions of passwords, but his carrier did not falter. Yeah, and I mean, if it's storing this much data behind it, you can assume that the people that they're set up to handle huge data loads at least. So maybe people would be downloading this to another server, maybe another governmental server somewhere, so they'd have super fast internet, and so it could handle lots of incoming and outgoing data, maybe. I guess. Naturally, speculation became rampant. Between the site's massive amount of data, seemingly impenetrable security, and rather unusual name, people's imaginations ran wild. If you're not familiar with the name Iscariot, it was the second name of Apostle and the ultimate betrayer of Jesus, Judas Iscariot. So that's where I knew it. I was like, this sounds familiar. And I was like, but I don't remember it being a dark com or anything like that. The rumors ranged from the benign to the truly sinister until a user by the name of Personal Jesus, most likely a new account created specifically for this occasion and a reference to the 1989 Depeche Mode song of the same name, claimed to have broken into the site. His version of events was that the website was a complete digital vault of the Vatican's secret archive, but that when he tried to download a file labeled as the Complete Gospel of Mary Magdalene, a document of which only fragments remain and there's no consensus among scholars on which Mary the Gospel is even written by, the site went offline. If you think this person's account sounds like total bullshit, I'm inclined to agree. When the members of the Usenet group went to check, the site was offline and it was never to return, but Jesus probably saw the site was already offline and then concocted the most interesting story that he could think of to get people's attention and win some internet points. Agreed, that does sound like nonsense. For those of you who spend a lot of time arguing on Twitter or Reddit, this is a friendly reminder that your internet points are not redeemable anywhere including the internet. A much more reasonable theory is that there was a ma this was a major piracy hub. If it was housing a digital warehouse of thousands of CDs, DVDs, and games, suddenly the multiple terabyte storage place sounds to make sense. Oh no, that's like way less interesting than my NSA theory. Although who's got such a huge pirate library in the 90s? And it also makes sense for the security. This also predated most file sharing programs, and while Metallica had yet to launch their lawsuit against Napster, the program was already under heavy scrutiny for illegal activity. Having such a single source for direct downloads that was kept as far out of the public eye as possible would be a much safer means for these early digital pirates to store their precious booty. Unfortunately, their site had garnered far more attention than it was ever intended to, so if this story is correct, then they likely pulled the plug on the operation in fear that the FBI would catch wind of carry its viral status and investigate the rumors. If that were true, I feel like they wouldn't have chosen the name iscariot.com. It would be like some super obscure URL that wouldn't be being found on like Google or some I looked it up on the Google. So, was Iscariot a storage space for online pirates, a Vatican digital archive, or something else entirely? And why did they choose such a uniquely recognizable and intriguing name for their top secret website? You know where I stand on the former, and I don't really have a guess on the latter, but what do you think, Simon? And most importantly, did this website ever exist at all? I am going to say no. Uh, purely for the reason that I don't think someone like the government or some pirate dudes who want to fly under the radar would choose the name Iscariot.com. I also think that the idea of, you know, multiple gigabytes and huge files and stuff being stored in the past, like, because I don't know, maybe I've mentioned this before, but I, I find the whole idea that we have so much data now and didn't in the past, all this stuff super interesting. Apparently, I'm a huge nerd. Um, but. I don't think it's real. I just have that vibe. I don't think this one is real. So one real, two false. 
Meridian 59. This mystery takes us all the way back to January 1997. Shortly after, I'm just going to make a note about which ones I think are true and false, actually, because I'll forget. So, one, true, two, false. Oh no, my script went back to the beginning. <laughs> This mystery takes us all the way back to January 1997, shortly before the release of the world's first 3D graphical MMORPG, Meridian 59. This game was published by 3DO, and one of the developers was John Hank, a man who went on to co-develop Google Earth and Pokemon Go. This game... Mm, 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 uh, I, I'm feeling it's too many details to be true. I'm getting that detail, like, too many detail vibes. Like, something I've never heard of, and then two things that I've definitely heard of. Although Google Earth and Pokemon Go do feel like they are similar, sort of, you know, they're both big mapping things, so maybe. This game is typical high fantasy setting that you would expect from MMNO, the sort of shit that bores time Simon to tears. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just not into fantasy. I love sci-fi. I just mentioned that I'm watching the whole of Star Trek Voyager again, but fantasy just never, just never my thing. The one truly unique thing about Meridian, however, is that you don't that it doesn't use a uh, class or level system like you find in most RPGs or fantasy games. You could increase your different skills and character attributes by performing different actions in the game, and there didn't seem to be a time limit to how powerful a character could become. The only limitations were how much time you wanted to spend playing and how much you could actually accomplish playing an MMO on dial-up. The other interesting thing about the game is that it was particularly PvP focused. PvP was a small part of early MMOs and mostly a shitty thing to do. I don't know what pe player versus player, right? High level EverQuest players would camp around the starting town and just murder all the new players when they tried to leave for the first time. <laughs> That's not the sort of behavior you want to encourage, so Meridian had a player run justice system to try and keep this kind of douchebaggery in check, but with no upper limit on how powerful a character can become. How do you keep the most powerful player in the game in check? Enter the very creatively minded, definitely not 15 year old edgelord death gun. <laughs> I love the name. <laughs> it's the most 15, what's your, what's your online name? Death gun. Yeah, big man. Death gun boasted that he had become so powerful that if he killed someone in the game, they would die in real life. That please. In the context of the game being played safely from the privacy of your own home on a computer that is in no way able to cause physical harm to you. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Unless you start sticking your hands inside it and be like, way! Maybe maybe put your hands in some water and then way inside with the wires. It's going to hurt you. But that's not what we're talking about here. Pointless tangent fact, boy. Get back to it. Uh, this all seemed utterly ridiculous. Players ignored it as some bragger kid that really, really needed to get out of his parents' basement and see the sun again. Completely agree. This can't be real. Enraged, uh, Death Gun killed a player in the game, and the player immediately disconnected, never to be heard from again. Sure, the player probably just rage quit or was in on the gag the whole time, but it was still pretty eerie to the people playing. At least at first it was. They quickly came to the same conclusion I just did, and then they were over it. So the next day, Death Gun struck again. This time he targeted a higher level player, one no one would think would just quit the game out of anger, and the same thing happens. Alright, I agree with Kevin on the first one. The guy just, uh, he, you know, it was he was either in on it or blah, blah, blah. The second one, I'm beginning to think that this very powerful player is like a developer of the game or something. And he's, you know, become so powerful because he's like, you know, an early player himself or he's cheated. And that he kills someone in the game and then he blacklists them, like he bans them. So it looks like they've just connected forever. That's what I think is going on then because I'm not thinking they died in real life, because that's absurd. An IRL friend of the fallen player disconnected as well to call and see why his friend had logged off, but there was no answer. Later that night, when his parents returned home from work, the 17-year-old was found dead at his keyboard. In total, Death Gun would claim seven victims before disappearing forever. This is bullshit. Before you start saying how ridiculous this sounds, because it does, I'm not proposing anything magical here. Obviously, the players weren't really being killed by the video game, and neither the police nor anyone else involved gave that notion any credence from the beginning. It didn't take long for police to figure out that Death Gun was merely the accomplice, and the real murderer had been inside the homes of each of the victims. I... Okay, obviously that is more... That is infinitely more plausible than the mystical version. But this is not real. <laughs> this is... It's too crazy. Like, how are you going to find that person's ID and then link them back? When was this going on? Like, 10 years ago? Oh, like 30 years ago? 20 years ago? 25 years ago? 1997? There's no way. They're not tracing it back and then putting the guy in the house. If this is real, I will be so shocked. 
These were the days before programs like Ventrilo or TeamSpeak, so there was no audio evidence at the time of the murders. Whoever the killer was, they were efficient. Not a professional, but definitely someone who had given the murders a lot of thought. There was minimal forensic evidence, and there were no fingerprints, DNA, or murder weapons left at the scene. The death gun account was found to have been made using a fraudulent credit card, and the user masked their IP well enough that 1997 era detectives did not know how to track the real location. The how is not the mystery here, and I would never have insulted your intelligence by proposing that maybe just maybe a character in a video game was able to kill someone in the real world via dial-up modem. That's some like, man, it always brings it back to that. Do you guys see that movie, The Ring? I feel like I brought this up in an episode the other day. That that movie with Nicole Kidman, as a kid, I watched that. I was so scared of it. I feel like I was talking about this in literally the last episode. But man, that was that was an intense film. But there is still that much but there is still much that remains unknown about this case. What are the identities of the real killers? All of the victims were within a hundred miles of the original murder, so were these targeted assassinations of individuals because of some sort of grudge or murders of geographic convenience? What happened to the credit score of the poor woman whose identity was stolen to apply for that fake credit card? And Simon, did these unsolved murders ever take place? No, no, no. A uh, strong no. I am going to be embarrassed and alarmed if that's true. It's just so silly. Great story, but it's silly. This is going to be really bad if it was actually true. <laughs> the College Dorm Power Strip For those that attend, I have to say, even though these are, I think two of them are false so far, they are written real believable. For those that attend, college is almost an unforgettable experience. The friends, the parties, the YouTube videos about how you don't care about school even though your parents bribed your way in. <laughs> oh, is that that college admissions thing? That is so crazy. It's like, yeah, 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 they're on the Olympic team for rowing. It's like, no, they weren't. And it's just like, yeah, but you know, here's some money. Uh, seems pretty crazy. This, I, I went to university. Um, not college. I guess it, it, college is university is just what we call college in the uk it was unforgettable it was a great time did four years of it in total enjoyed it all for the most part um yeah i enjoy life in general to be honest though imagine you're on your computer in your college dorm one night definitely not browsing only fans i get the feeling kevin's a lot younger than me isn't only fans only like, it's like only a few years old right i was at university like 20 years ago making me feel 15 years ago. how old am i 34 15 years ago i am feeling old right now kevster uh, when suddenly you hear a crackle, quickly followed by a loud bang. The computer screen flickers off, and you hear the spinning of the hard drive slow until silence. Maintenance tells you that there was a power surge and a fuse is blown. It will take two hours to fix. You get off the phone and notice the plug to your iMac is charred and damaged. With all this time to kill, and, and too much of a broke college student to be able to afford more loot boxes in Raid Shadow Legends, you decide to open up your power strip and see the extent of the damage. Uh, it's a power strip. I'll be like real bored. I guess, yeah, no, fair play. Fair play as a student. I'll be just in my room. What am I going to do? May as well crack open that unplugged power strip and have a gander inside. See what happens. I'd also be like, my Mac's probably f***ed, isn't it? The power's coming back on, but that Mac ain't coming back on. And I'll be like, I'm a student. Am I about to have to spend a grand on a Mac? Be like, ah, oh, that was, I mean, I know it's a lot of money now, but I mean, oh my God, that was a lot of money back in the day. Inside the power strip, you see a circuit board that doesn't look like it belongs. Attached is a SIM card and some other metal component that you don't recognize. You snap a bunch of pictures on your phone and start posting them to Reddit on r slash what is this thing. Because, well, you'd very much like to know what that thing is. That is f***ing scary. Someone is spying on your ass. The answers come back immediately. You're informed that it is a GPS tracker and microphone with cellular uplink. Oh my god. <laughs> I know we're surrounded by microphones all the time, but it's like private parts of my life, like private conversations, private stuff, all of this. It's like nowadays, I, I don't like going to restaurants where it's like too quiet because a few times I've just been sat there. There was one time that was so awkward and it was like one of the first times it ever happened to me. I was just like sitting in a restaurant in a pub, just like talking with my friend for like two hours. And I mean, I'm not like a or anything I, i'm sure i'm not saying like anything super controversial or anything but it's just a private conversation i'm having with my mate about our lives like all of this stuff that you're like well yeah it's a private conversation and then it's one of those places where the tables are so close together and everything and then just as we're leaving the guy at the table so next to me is like hey man i just want to say i really love your stuff and i'm like 
Oh, God. I'm sure it's like I did, you know, it's just one of those things. And now when I go places, it's happened a couple of times since then. I mean, not not quite so intimately because I'm more aware now. But I'm like, it's it's like I, I just don't like the idea of being spied on. <laughs> and I know like a little loss of privacy is what you get when you're an internet fact boy. But uh, th finding this, I'll be like, what the f***? What's going on? In short, your power strip was bugged. This sounds a bit far-fetched, but for Redditor Shady Business 15, not at all a suspicious username, this was his new reality. By all accounts, Shady was a regular university student in the United Kingdom who had no logical reason, at least none that he would disclose, why anyone would be bugging his room. An investigation into the SIM card yielded little useful information. The cell company, unsurprisingly, wanted a subpoena in order to give up information, and Shady didn't want to go to the police. The Reddit Bureau of Investigation, yes, it's a real sub subreddit, also was able to identify that this was professionally done. There were too many small wires and the soldering was too professional. It was probably done by a machine, so this probably wasn't just a haphazard prank. The bug could not have been installed into the power strip on location. It had to have been already there. So where did the power strip come from? Shady assumed that he took it from his parents' house. One of his first instincts was that this was the work of helicopter parents that just couldn't leave him well alone, but he wanted to investigate further. Oh my god, dude, your dad's a spy. Or your mum's a spy. That's my vibe right now. It's like, I don't know, like power strips. You just get them from places. I moved into this office where I work now, and there were power strips here. And I just used them. And now I'm like, oh my god, am I going to have to check inside my power strips? <laughs> this is that sort of, like... That, that paranoia that you have and you're like wait is this does this be like that is like checking inside your power strips i feel is like verging on schizophrenia but then i'll read something like this and i'll be like oh my god <laughs> what if there are bugs inside my power strips the people listening on the ends of the bugs right now are like i hope he doesn't check the power strips oh <laughs> is he looking at us jesus do you think he knows but he wanted to investigate further. He put the SIM card into his phone and then sent himself a text message to get the SIM's ca SIM card's phone number. Researching the number turned up nothing, so he left the card in his phone overnight to see if any incoming calls came, as that seemed to be triggering the mechanism for the bug to start recording again. Again, nothing. But was Shady even the target of the bug? He'd taken the power strip from his parents' house, so had they installed it themselves to give it to him and to what end? Or his parents the target? Shady could not give any details on the likelihood of this, but another hypothesis voted around that it could have been a power strip that his parents liberated from work that had been planted there for use in corporate espionage. Oh, yes, this is, okay, this is probably more realistic than the spy thing. It'd be really helpful to know what his parents did for a living. Because if it was like, yeah, he's a high-level patent clerk or whatever, you'll be like, ah, 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 that's some spying going on right there. Or if it's like, he works in tech support for a giant unnamed corporation, you'll be like, he's a spy. He's a spy. Your dad's a spy. <laughs> you should probably tell him about this bug. He's going to, you know, he's going to want to take that into work tomorrow. Who the intended target was and for what purpose had has remained a mystery for almost a decade. But there's one thing we know for certain. The bug had been active for over a year, and at the time Shady found it, seven months after moving into his university dorm, it was still active and the SIM card still had ten pounds of credit on it. The card had not been topped off for three months, but logically, that wording means it had been topped off in the fourth month prior, three months after finding its way into the university dorm. However, sometimes you just have to top them up to keep them active, but then if it's only got £10 of credit, someone... This is so suspect. If we accept that both the bug and the electrical damage seem to be too authentic to be faked, an assumption that I'm willing to make, that still leaves so many questions. Who was shady really? Why would someone bug a college student? And if they had bugged a corporation when the power strip was removed and wound up in some college dorm, why did they continue to listen in for months? All I know is that I need to go open up my power strips right now just to be safe. But before I do that, I need to know what Simon thinks the truth behind this mysterious bug is or if it was all just in my imagination. Ah, oh, I mean, this one's real, isn't it? <laughs> I really hope it's not, because it's fucking scary as shit. But I think this one's real, man. I really do. And I really hope it's not. People, I'm cast your votes. I'm casting my vote. I think it's true. I think it's true. I think it's terrifyingly true. Ah! Chip Chan. Once upon a time, this is the last one, by the way. 
Once upon a time in 2008, an anonymous user on 4chan's X board, the board for paranormal goings on, posted a link to an unsecured webcam feed that they'd found. The feed was of a Korean woman doing nothing for hours. At first, people thought she may have been dead because she remained motionless and contorted for over 10 hours, but eventually they saw signs of life. As the stream picked up popularity, despite the Korean woman never doing anything besides being in her apartment, she began to share the story. Uh, she began to share her story with viewers. Here is the rundown of what the woman sh shared. She was trapped in her house because a corrupt police officer that she referred to simply as P had implanted a Vera chip in her ankle to monitor and control her. I don't believe that that happened, controlling someone with a chip, but I do believe that she believes uh, so far this is realistic. Not the chip in her, but the fact that she would believe there's a chip in her, or that she to tells this lie. She claimed it allowed him to see and hear what she did, and also he could use it to control when and how she slept. It is, this is how she got the name Chip Chan. She also claims that her parents both died and left her a large inheritance, which is why she was able to afford to live on her own while almost never leaving the room, and that P is trying to get rid of her to get the money for himself. As time went on, her story changed, and the Vera Chip was no longer just a means of surveillance. It was a means of mind control. No one knows who Chip Chan is or what her real name is. We know that she lives in Seoul, South Korea, but that's pretty much it. Everything else has come directly from Chip Chan herself, but is not and but she is not a reliable source. While much of the story seems extremely improbable, though technically plausible, the mind control stuff is really is really where it breaks down. Viewers have been captivated by the strange Korean woman streaming herself do little more than sleep for 24 hours a day. But what really grabbed their attention was the genuine distress that she seemed to express while talking about what was being done to make her a captive. There are a lot of theories, but in the interest of time, I'm going to stick to one that seems to be the most likely and is far scarier than any internet ghost story. Most likely, Chip Chan is a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> oh, this gives me shivers. Like, none of it's real and it's all in her head. Ah! Oh. She seems genuinely distressed because, to her, everything she is saying is the truth. It's also theorized that P is a social worker or a healthcare worker who is supposed to monitor her mental health in some way. Vera chips are basically RFID implants for humans to be used as a means of identification. It is reasonable to say that someone who no longer seems to be on speaking terms with reality may not be so fastidious about carrying her IDs on her at all times in the off chance that she did leave her apartment. This all makes the most sense, but it still doesn't necessarily explain everything. Yeah, also, people aren't okay with having chips put in them. At the time of writing this, Chip Chan does not seem to be streaming anymore. She is still uploading videos to YouTube, but I do not recommend you watch them. She's now terrified that they've been bombarding her with a mind control device so much that it is burning her alive. Her recent videos are all of her legs burned and scabbed over. For at least, wow, that's okay on YouTube? No, I don't think so. For the past few months, all of her videos have been her burned and damaged body, predominantly her legs and hands. Chip Chan's identity remains unknown, as does her exact condition. Another mystery in this whole story is why she was streaming herself 24-7. Part of me understands that she may think P was less likely to cause her harm if she was on camera, but a bigger part of me doesn't understand why a paranoid schizophrenic would want to deliberately put themselves under that level of surveillance. Um, yeah, but paranoid schizophrenia it's not just as simple as that, is it? It's going to be com more complicated, and there's probably good spies and bad spies, and people's minds get complicated. Or maybe it's all performative, some crazy art project that 14 years later has still not reached its conclusion. If Chip Chan's health keeps declining, we may never receive an answer to these questions. That is, if Chip Chan isn't just a concoction of a villainous writer hellbent on setting her, his brethren free. And so now comes the moment of truth, Simon. Which of these five stories is a true unsolved mystery of the internet? Are any of them true? Are they all? Are you sick of rhetorical questions? <laughs> Am I so pedantic that I gave you a true mystery of the internet but omitted the fact that it is no longer unsolved so I could win on a technicality? There's only one way to find out. Let's watch the video. Uh, what do we think of that last one? I think it's true. I think it's true. So just to recap, uh, cast your vote at home. One true, two false, three false, four true, five true. All right. I'm pretty excited, man. That power strip one better not be f***ing true. Ah! Play after script. Download the video. Let's go. So, Simon, how do you think you did? Are you ready to hear the truth? First, the mysterious disappearance of La Mantita. While the story resurfaces every couple of years, no new leads or information has been found. The man's account is believed to be genuine, and he is currently missing and presumed dead. Oh, it was true. The first one's true. Nailed it. That brings us to the mysterious site Iscariot.com. 
The second one was the uh, uh, Isteria, Iscariot.com, the big data farm thing, which I thought was false. The site never existed at all. Never existed. Well, many of the details were taken from the true mystery of Mortis.com. There were never any rumors of Vatican secrets being held on the site. Perhaps it is a topic we can discuss in a future video. As for Meridian 59... Meridian 59, remind me, how can I not remember? This is like literally 20 minutes ago. Uh, Meridian 29 was the guy who is killing people in real life and also in games, and I thought that was false. I had to operate on two assumptions in the hopes of fooling you. The first was that you would believe I would never include such a ludicrous sounding story, except as a bluff, because it was true. And the second assumption was that you don't watch anime. I don't watch anime. Well, the details of Meridian 59 were accurate. The murder conspiracy was actually just the plot of season two of Sword Art Online. <laughs> okay, so it was false, and it was okay. So anyone watching anime who watches anime, uh, which I know some of you, because sometimes my writers will slip in jokes about anime, and people will be like, "Hey, anime reference!" Simon just whoosh over his head. Uh, okay, so I'm three for three so far. Oh God, I really think this power strip one is true. <laughs> The chain of custody of the power strip is too muddy to know who the bug was intended for or why. But the bug itself and the account of how it was discovered are genuine. Finally, that brings us to shit. I don't like it! I'm so un I'm so upset that I'm right! <laughs> oh man. Unfortunately, the story is true. Oh! Oh! Five for five! Well, her identity and her exact condition remains unknown. She appears to be a severely mentally ill woman who is unwilling and unable to get the help that she needs. So how did you do Simon? The continued captivity of your writers depends on it. Remember to grade yourself honestly, because I'll be watching. For the viewers at home, did you enjoy playing along as well? If you'd like to see more breaks from the normal form like this, be sure to get in the comments and let us know. Oh, my laundry's done. <laughs> and he says, oh, my laundry's done. Oh, uh, Kevin, this was absolutely brilliant. I don't know where the creepy place you filmed this is, but your garage looks terrifying, if that's what it is. Guys, I loved the hell out of this. Please get in the comments. Please, let's do more of this. Honestly, if I just did a channel that was this, I would have an absolute blast. Um, so let me know what you think. This was this was crazy fun, and I can't believe I got five out of five. I really genuinely did expect to. And uh, they were really well done, Kevin. They were really well done. And that power strip one is going to haunt my nightmares. So, for now, this has been Decoding the Unknown. Sort of, literally, I guess. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy or listening, if you enjoyed, thumbs up, subscribe. Also, if you're listening as a podcast, uh, please do um, leave us a review. That'd be grand. And I'll see you next time.